in the house today and just give God worship this morning. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come in this house. We thank you for life and health and strength in these bodies. We thank you for the ability to see with these eyes that you have given to us, with these ears to hear clothed within our own right mind, Lord God. We're thankful, Lord God, to live in a country where we can come and rejoice and worship you freely. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. We pray for every soul that walks in today, Lord God. Many may smile on the outside, but we're all facing difficulties, Lord and they may find strength and encouragement here this morning and that wherever we are off in our lives Lord God that you would nudge us back in the right direction transform our lives help us to find freedom in you we pray and ask for your presence in this service this morning have your way Lord God we say have your way Lord God May Jesus be glorified, and it is in his name we pray, Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. and amen. Give God a hand of praise this morning. Amen. Let us have our declaration of transform transformation this morning. Let's get right into the word. Let us read, today I will be transformed by the power of God's word. It defines me, empowers me and enriches me as I apply it to every area of my life. My mind is open, my heart is receptive, and I surrender my will to the Holy Spirit's control. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Look to your neighbor to your left and to your right, give them a hug, tell them good morning. Just go ahead and welcome them in here today. As you take your seat. <laughs> say good morning to you this morning good morning good morning I want to make sure that I advise you of a special announcement just as we get started uh, on Saturday March 14th here at the church I want to make sure to invite if you are serving as a leader here in the church or serving in any capacity here at the church we are having a leader meeting um, that my wife and I are putting on um, to where we just kind of want to cast vision and share and have fellowship with you many times things are going on and everyone doesn't always know and so we always like to try to communicate so we want to make sure to invite you on the second Saturday March 14th here at the church at 1130 a.m. 11:30 a.m. The meeting won't be long. It'll generally be between about 40, 45 minutes. But we just want to get together and share with you, love on you, and commune with you as leaders here at the church. Give you the opportunity if there's anything that's going on that you may not know, but also to let you know what's coming down the path, coming down the uh, the future path down the road. So we invite you to come. Please make some time to come and uh, hear what God is doing and um, some of the things that may not always be communicated in the pulpit. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. So again, Saturday the 14th, um, here at the church, 11.30 a.m. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
How's everybody doing? You all doing blessed? Okay, so we're going to jump right in the Word. Um, I'm starting a, a new series here for the next two or three Sundays. Um, we're going to be talking about the biblical principle of stewardship. Look at your name and say stewardship. I have received so many um, testimonies and um, just blessings from so many of you from the things that we were discussing in January about how the Lord had been blessing you, particularly as it related to financial things. And I'm just going to be honest, many times the reason why we aren't receiving God's blessings is because we're not doing what God tells us to do. And I've learned that if you just put into practice the things that God says, you get blessed, man. You don't, you don't have to do anything special. You just have to do what God tells us to do. And so I was talking to one gentleman, and he came up to me at the church, and he was in a small group. And he said, Pastor, man, you know, i got to be honest. I, was, I, I went home, and I got with my wife, and we got on a budget. And we sat down, and we did our budget together, and we started working through it. Man, I found out that I had $1,600 going out the door that I didn't even know where the money was going. He said, $1,600. I say, $1,600. I said, yeah, man, we've been trying to get a house, and I couldn't find the money to buy the house. I say, there it is. There go God right there. You ain't got to look no further. You just got to do what God tells you to do with money. Amen? And so today, stewardship to me is one of the most important truths in all of the Bible. If you get stewardship, I think many things in life just begins to change in the way how you look at stuff and the way how we shape our lives. So this morning, I want to talk to you. It's going to be two or three messages, and they're all going to build on top of each other because I think that all of these are important. So this morning, we're going to talk about stewardship. Look at your name and say stewardship again. Stewardship. 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 Now, how many of you have heard of a man named Bernie Madoff? Yes. Do you all know who Mr. Madoff is? Bernie Madoff was an American hedge fund manager and the former chairman of the NASDAQ. He is best known for stealing billions, not millions, but billions of dollars from investors, including clients as known as Steven Spielberg, Kevin Bacon, Larry King, and many others. And I found him interesting because he did it by cultivating close friendships with wealthy people, influential businessmen. He would sign them as investors, and he would pay them consistent high returns. Even when the economy was not performing well, he would still pay out returns of 10% or higher. And if you've got a lot of money in something, 10% is, is a good return. He did this even when the economy was not performing well. And this eventually built a prestigious reputation among investors, which consistently led to more and more clients. The clients that he had kept getting good returns, and so they were already known and famous, and they would keep referring more and more and more. Now, you may wonder, how can a person give high returns even when the economy is not doing good? Well, he did it through something called a Ponzi scheme. Look at your name and say a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi. What is a Ponzi scheme? A Ponzi scheme is when early investors are repaid with money acquired from later investors rather than actual investment income. So what Bernie was doing was he was soliciting new clients to invest in his company, and then he used the money from the new clients to pay the former clients or the ones who had already invested a handsome realty even when the market was not going good. He did this and everything works well as long as you keep having new investors come in with new money. This worked good. In fact, it worked so good, Bernie was able to live the high life for many, many years. I read a report which indicated that he had a $7 million penthouse in Manhattan, he had an $11 million mansion in West Palm Beach. He had a three-bedroom apartment in Cap de Antibes, or whatever this is, in the French Riviera. He had $45 million himself in municipal bonds, $17 million in cash, $8.8 .8 million in yachts and boats, $2.6 million in jewelry. 
it said it was estimated he had personal assets totaling over $800 million. Life was good for Mr. Madoff. However, reports tell us that the scheme collapsed during the 2008 financial collapse. Y'all remember when the economy went bad and everybody started calling in for their money. They wanted to get their money back. The problem is Mr. Madoff didn't have the money. He had already spent it on himself. He had taken the money, listen, and used it for his own purposes. Money that wasn't his, he took and used for his own purposes. In the end, it was estimated that he was responsible for the loss of 50 to 65 billion dollars of investor money. Not million, billion dollars. And is currently spending 150 years in prison. Now, why did Mr. Madoff get himself into trouble? He got himself into trouble because he forgot that he was just an asset fund manager and not the owner of the fund. The money that he was spending didn't belong to him. It belonged to all those investors that entrusted the money to him. How many of you know and hate when somebody takes something that's not yours or takes something that's not theirs and then use it for their own business or their own benefit or their own purposes without your permission? How many of you like when people do that? If you live with someone, you've probably had somebody to do that to you. Have you ever gone out to eat and saved you a special piece of chicken? <laughs> a lasagna that you had? Whatever it was, you, 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 had, you went to a cookout or something and they had some barbecue and you set that barbecue aside and you took it and you put it in the refrigerator and you went to work the next day and you were just waiting to get back home. You were thinking of that chicken all day long. You were sitting there thinking, man, when I get home, I'm going to warm up that chicken, I'm going to put that chicken in the oven and I'm going to eat that chicken and I'm going to sit down and then you get home and some joker in your house has went in that refrigerator. <laughs> and took your piece of chicken and ate it for themselves. Or maybe you had some money that you left on the counter that you were planning to do something with and, and somebody came in your house and used it without your knowledge or your permission. Don't stuff like that just kind of burn you up when people take what's not theirs and use it for their own purposes without your authorization or you allowing them to do that. Do I got a witness that that causes your blood to boil? Well, the truth of the matter is the Bible tells us that every last one of us in this church are guilty of that when it comes to God. Because the truth of the matter is, just like Bernie, the Bible teaches that you and I are only asset managers of God's resources and God's stuff. If you understand that truth, it will totally change everything about how you live the Christian life. Everything, number one, the first principle of Christian stewardship that we have to understand is that God owns everything. Look at your neighbor and say, God owns everything. Look at your other neighbor and say that God owns everything. Watch this. Listen. It's easy to say, but listen to me. God owns everything. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 24, verse 1, it says the earth is the Lord's. That means it belongs to the Lord or it's owned by the Lord. The earth is or belongs to the Lord. And what else does he say? And Everything in it, the world, and all who what? That means everything belongs to God. Look at your name and say everything. Everything belongs to God. That car you drove up in this morning, I know you think that belongs to you. This is an important principle of stewardship. I know you may have it, but you don't own it. Watch this. Psalms 89 and 11 says it this way. The heavens are what? Yours. Yours. 
the heaven. It didn't say heaven. It says the heavens. The heavens speak of, the, the, of space and the universe and, and even the dimensions that God in. The Bible says that God owns everything. He even owns the heavens. He owns space. He owns all the planets. He owns everything. He owns the celestial space. Everything that God owns, it says the earth is also yours. It says the world, what? And all it contains. Why does it all belong to God? Look at what else it says. Because you have what? You see that? The Bible says that everything belongs to God because he founded it. He created it. The, the psalmist declares that the reason that God owns everything is not simply because he's God, but because he created it. How many of you know that when you create something, one of the first things that you do is you put a patent on it? And when you put that patent on it, that's something that you own, at least in our time, for a specific period of time. But a patent means that you own that. In other words, God has a patent on everything. He owns Everything. He owns the car that you drive, the house that you live, the clothes that you got on, the 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 weave that you got on. He 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 own it. He own it all. Watch this. The Bible teaches that God even owns you. Watch this. The Bible says in First Corinthians chapter six, verse nineteen. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, what else does it say? You are not your own. You were bought with a... Watch this. This is important. That means God owns you. No, he don't. Yes, he does. He owns you. He owns your hair. He owns everything about you. Watch this. So what does that mean? Listen. If God owns everything, then that means you don't own anything. So I knew the amens was going to go down. John. Er, 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 and see, when people don't know where you're going, then, then they, they, they witch it. But see, when it hits, the Bible says, you, you just said that God owns everything. So if God owns everything, then that means you don't own anything. That means... The money in your bank account, you don't own. Amen. Uh-oh. 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 Pastor, no amen on that one. The car you driving, you don't own. The hat you got on, you don't own. Wait now, think about this. You, you don't own anything. Your children, you don't own. Your boo, your hubby, your lovey. You don't own. Listen, you don't own anything. In fact, the Bible says the things that you have is because God gave it to you. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 says this. And you shall remember the Lord your God. Why? For it is he who gives you the power to get. So that means Everything that you have, the reason why you got it is because God gave it to you. It's not because you were so smart. It's not because you were so good looking. Everything you have, God gave it to you. Listen, in fact, the Bible says every good thing that you have ever gotten in your life has been because God gave it to you. Okay, James 1 and 1, James 1 and 17 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. There is no variableness. God gives us everything that we have. Do we agree on that? Everything belongs to God and everything that you have is simply because God gave it to you. All right, now, here's the problem. The problem is, is that many of us think that the things that God has entrusted to you that you own, when actually all he's done is loan it to you. Amen. Amen. See, that, that's where all the conflict comes in is because you have it and you live in it that you feel like I own it and you don't own it. God has only loaned it to you. Amen. Okay, let, let, me, let me try to say, see, the business you own, you, you don't own it. 
God loaned it to you. See, when you understand this, you look at everything a little different. Watch this. In the Bible, the Bible teaches that God created us to manage or be stewards over his stuff. Watch this. But he never gave you ownership of it. He has always maintained ownership. You've just been uh, assigned, if you will, as a manager over certain things. Let me prove it to you. Look in your Bibles in Genesis chapter 1. And I, again, I pray you don't have any problem finding that chapter. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. Okay, let's recap. In verses 1 through 26, the Bible says this is the creation of man. If you want to figure out what God was doing, go to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, there are really two things that God, really one primary thing that God created you to do. Genesis chapter 1, verse, verses 1 through 26 is a recount of creation. The Bible says that God created the earth. He created the stars. He created the heavens. He created the grass. He created the cows. He created the trees. He created the plants. He created the fruit. He created all the different stuff, right? He created it, and he looked at it, and he said it was all good. Now, the psalmist has declared that whoever creates owns. Do you remember that, Psalm 89? It says that God owns it because he formed it. So in verses 1 through 26, God is laying claim that I own everything. I created all the stars, all this. I created it. Watch this. Then you get to verse 26, and God says that he decides to create something unique. He decides to create mankind, and mankind is different from every one of his creations because the Bible says with verse 26 that he created man in his image and after his Likeness. Man is different. It's speaking of his design. Man is different from every other creation. But look there in verse 27. He declares the purpose or the function of why he created man. He, he, he declares what he created us to do. And look there. It says he created man to have dominion. Do you see that? Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. And do, you, do you see what I'm reading? This is important. The fish of the sea, the fowl of the air over the cattle, over all the earth and everything that creepeth what? On it. You need to hear what I'm saying. When God created us, he created us with a purpose. And the purpose was to have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, cattle, all of the earth, everything that creepeth on it. The second thing was he created us to be fruitful, to be multiplied, to replenish or fill the earth, to subdue it, and to have dominion, what? Over the fish and over the cattle and over everything that moves. Do you see that on there? Watch this. So there's one primary reason that God created us to do. Do you see it? It is to have dominion. Look at your neighbor and say dominion. dominion. You're supposed to have dominion. Look at your other neighbor and say, you're supposed to have dominion. dominion. Watch this. God, God created us to have dominion. Listen, what does dominion mean? You can go to any Bible bookstore, probably online. Just look up the word in any Greek or Hebrew concordant. The word means to subjugate. It means to subdue or to conquer. It means to rule. It means to reign. Say that with me. To subdue. To conquer, conquer. to rule, rule. or to reign. reign. Watch this. In other words, God created man to exercise authority upon the earth. Do you hear what I'm saying? You were created to exercise authority upon the earth. Uh, Think of it like this. Um, uh, God owns a company called Heaven Enterprises. And in Heaven Enterprises, it owns everything. It owns the stars, the moons, the heaven, the earth. It owns everything. And how many of you know that when you have a wealthy person, they appoint people to oversee their stuff? Bill Gates owns billions and billions of dollars of stuff. You know, Bill Gates don't manage all that stuff. He has people to do that stuff, right? So in God's kingdom, God has created you and I to manage and oversee his creation earth. Does that make sense? When he created us, the Bible tells us that he created us to exercise 
dominion or authority over what? What did he say to exercise dominion or authority of? It's right there in the text. It says, let them have dominion over what? The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, over all the earth and over everything that creepeth what? On the earth. In other words, the things that I have created, I have created y'all jokers to manage it for me. Does that make sense? Watch this. Our primary concern from God is to execute authority over the things that he has created. The second thing that it says there was to be fruitful, to multiply, to replenish. The word replenish means to fill the earth. Now, that, that one, you say, well, why does God want you to do that? Because in order for us to manage and oversee everything that he has in the earth, how many know that one man can't do that? Right? So a purpose, how many know, see, God designed us to be fruitful and multiply. It's, it's a part of our design and the reason why he created us. Somebody ought to say amen on that. Amen. Your, your body is designed to procreate. I'm glad mine is. <laughs> you, 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 when, when God created us, he designed us in the context of marriage to fulfill his purpose, which is to fulfill this earth so that we can manage and have dominion over what? The fish, the fowl, over everything that crawls on the earth. Do you all see that? That was the primary purpose of God to rule all of his stuff. Now, here's the thing that I want you to see. God created us and he gave us authority to rule and exercise authority over all the earth, but he never gave us ownership of anything. Watch this. You can look in your Bible. You will never find anywhere in there to where God gave you ownership of anything. He, he gives you authority to rule and manage some things, but he always retains ownership. Let me ask you a question. Why is ownership so important? Or put it this way. What's the difference between owning something and managing something? Who can give me a hand real quick? Yell it out. What's the difference between managing something and owning something? Any thoughts? What did you say? You don't own it. So what's, what's the difference between managing something and owning it? What did you say? You're taking care of somebody else's stuff. There it is. That's what I'm talking about right there. Whoever owns it has the right to tell you what to do with it. Does that make sense? In other words, if I own something, I have the final say-so on what you do with it. In other words, I cast a vision. I tell you what you can do with my stuff because you don't own it, I own it. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, my wife works for Mark Zuckerberg. She works for Facebook. And... He has given her authorization or authority to manage a certain part of his company. How many know that when you have authority to operate and run certain areas of your business, you can make decisions on your own as to what happens in that business? But one thing you cannot do is determine what to do with someone else's resources. How many know you can't decide what to do with his money with what you want to do? Does that make sense? In other words, he still decides what his money and his resources are going to be used for and how they are going to be used. Right. Does that make sense? Why? Because he owns it. The problem comes when you start taking ownership of somebody else's stuff and determining to do what you want to do with their stuff. That's right. But amen's down went down. See, see, some of us in here are taking ownership of God's stuff. That, that's where all this is headed. If God owns everything, which you've already admitted, then what that means is he is the one who determines what happens with his stuff. Amen. Come on, somebody give me amen. amen. Tell me that you're getting it. That's, that's the whole concept of stewardship is if God owns it, then you don't determine what to do with my stuff. Amen. See, that's what got Adam in trouble in the first place. When you look in your Bible, look in Genesis, turn over to Genesis chapter two, if you would. Look at what got Adam in trouble. What got Adam in trouble was he tried to take ownership of what belonged to God and use it in a way that God said you're not supposed to use it. 
Okay, look, look there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Notice what it says. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. In another word, what he's saying is, he's to manage my garden. Does that make sense? The Lord put Adam there to tend and to keep it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Do you see that? He says, of every tree. In other words, God says, I'm giving you authorization to eat off all my trees. Does that make sense? Wait a minute now. You need to understand. He, he's saying, I'm giving you authorization to eat off of all my trees. Why did God have to say that? Because he owned the trees. Listen, if Adam owned the trees, God wouldn't have had to tell him that you can eat off of my trees. Right? The reason why God told him you can eat off of some of my trees is because he owned the trees. Right. And God said, you can eat off any of these trees that you want. But in verse 17, I think it was, he says, but of this tree, you can't eat off of that one. Y'all see that in there? In other words, God says, oh, all the trees belong to me. Everything in this garden belongs to me. Everything on the earth belongs to me. You can eat off of these. But this tree right here, this is my tree right here. I don't want nobody to eat off of that tree. I don't, know, I don't want nobody to touch my chicken right here. <laughs> let, let, me, let me bring it home for us. I, I, don't, I don't want nobody to touch this, this barbecue right here. This, this is my prize winner right here. Nobody touches this. Watch this. Where did Adam go wrong? <laughs> See, you got to remember, it's, it wasn't about the fruit. He took something that wasn't his. Do you see that? Now, the question becomes, well, why would God do that in the first place? In other words, if you say I can eat all the trees in the garden, all the fruit, I, you, you open up all these trees for me. Why did you put this one tree in the middle of the garden and say I can't eat that tree? Anybody got that question? I mean, Shoot, why couldn't I just eat off of all the trees? God, aren't you being unfair? <laughs> Wait a minute now, come on. Is, it, is God not being unfair? You got all these trees. No. Why can't you just eat off all the trees? No. Boy, I, I like you right there. I don't even know who you I like you. <laughs> Listen, the, the bigger question is, is not why God said that. The bigger question is, let me ask this. Does God have the right to tell Adam, you can't eat off of this tree? Yes. Why? Because he owned all the jokers. Wait a minute, I'm headed somewhere. God had the right. The bigger question is not why God said it, because the tree, everything in there belongs to him. He told Adam, you can eat off of everything except for this one tree. And the reason why, I don't have to explain to you. I don't have to tell you a gosh darn thing. Come on, somebody. Um, my wife bought me a PlayStation for my birthday. <laughs> yeah, I don't get a chance. She bought me a PlayStation for my birthday, right? Bless her heart. And I, I don't get the opportunity to play it very much because I, I normally have plenty of stuff to do. But my boys love it. They love PlayStation. So I, I try to make time to hang out with them to play the PlayStation. But the problem is, the problem is, them jokers, when they start playing it, they always fighting. They fighting all the time. They real competitive. Oh, you scored the touchdown. Oh, you won because of this. Oh, you the blah, 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 blah. And they constantly fighting. So I, I had to make a rule. I had to make the rule that said, y'all jokers don't play this PlayStation unless I'm here physically in the room and I'm playing with y'all. Now, my son TJ, it's 10. That joker had the audacity <laughs> to come to me and say, Dad, I don't think that is right that you say that I, we can only play the PlayStation when you're not here. Why is it that I can't play it? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it means. 
Take a Josh, I started, I started pulling the thing off. But I said, Holy Spirit leading God me. I said, what, what, what you saying, son? You first, first you need to lower the bass in your voice a little bit because you're coming at me like, like you're challenging me. Wait a minute now. I told that joke. I said, wait a minute now. First of all, who PlayStation is it? Well, it's yours. I said, who daddy am I? Well, you mine. I say, look, Joker, I don't have to give you any reason why you can't play with my PlayStation because the bottom line is it's not your PlayStation. And as long as it's mine, I tell you what, save up your allowance money and then you can go get it. He said, well, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Then I'm going to play it on my own. I said, well, here's the problem. You also got to have power, too. Uh-huh. And if you ain't got no electricity, you can't get no account in your name with the little money that you make for your allowance. Watch this. But here's the thing. How many of us are just like TJ? Don't, man, y'all don't look at me crazy. Y'all jokers know you taking ownership of something that don't belong to you and you telling God how to do what don't even belong to you. Come on, I can do what I want to do with my body. No, you can't. Well, well, you can, but you're going to get yourself in trouble. Why? Because you don't own your body. Yes, I do, Pastor. See, that, that's the thing. You don't own your body. Yes, I do. No, you don't. I can sleep with who I want. No, you can't. No, because the person who owns your body has set up limitations and guidelines that says you can use your body for this. And as long as you use it for this, you good. But when you start stepping out, you've taken ownership of something that doesn't belong to you. And let, let, let me ask a question. How many of you, okay, I, I got to, I'm, I'm about to close. Let me, let me ask you a question. Um, huh, okay, let, let's summarize. First thing is, is God owns everything. Look at your neighbor and say, God owns everything. God owns everything. If, if you don't remember anything, I want you to remember this. First thing is, God owns everything. He owns everything that you think that you own, you don't own, God owns. Your education, your degrees, your program, your business, your hair, your weave, your shoes, your necklace, your nails, he owns it all. Second thing of stewardship is, is if, if you acknowledge that God owns everything, if you acknowledge that, if you agree with that, then that means he determines, as the owner, what should happen to that. Amen. That means if God owns all my money, I ain't going to get no amens on that one. But if God owns all my money, well, not my money, but if God has entrusted to me the money that I have that he owns, that means he determines how it's spent. Would you agree with that? Okay. So this message is leading to the next one. So what happens when you take something that doesn't belong to you and use it in a way that the owner doesn't want it used? Because if you own something, then most people, if you own something, you have a certain way you want your stuff to be used. Um, You have a certain... um, you know, you want your stuff to be used a certain way. Okay, so if, if, if I went out, everybody drove up in their car. If I went out, took your keys while you were in service, got in your car, ate McDonald's and everything in your car, spilled stuff in your car on your, on your floor and on your seat, and took your car, went down to Orlando, drove around, brought your car back dirty and a mess, what would y'all jokers do? I mean, I took it without your permission, and I'm using it in a way that you ain't told me I can use it. What you going to do? Okay, I'm trying to make a physical thing of a spiritual thing. If you can see this in the spiritual, you're going to see what I'm talking about in the next couple of minutes. From God's perspective, when you take something that he say don't, and you use it in a way that he say don't use it. 
I can tell you two things you're going to do. If you're scared of me, you're going to call the popo. If you're not scared of me, you're going to try to put hands on me. And then I'm going to have to show you, Shanetta, that these glasses. <laughs> Jay, how Sugar Ray be doing it? And I'm going to have to show you that you can't put no hands on me. Watch this. Here's, here, here's the point. God, if God owns everything, there's a way that he designed or, or wants his stuff to be used. Amen. Where many of us are getting in trouble is that you're using something that God has given to you in a way and a purpose that God never designed it to be used. And in the same way, you would act a fool if somebody took your stuff and misused it. That's what's happening to some of us in here, Amen. right? you got to make sure that you're using what God has entrusted to you in a way that he wants you to use it. That, that's the central core of the message today. Next week, I'm going to build on it. What did God design us or what has God told us to use the things that he has given us for? That's where we're going to go at next week. The main thing I just wanted you to understand is that God owns everything that you own. Amen. Everything that you think you own, you don't own. Amen. And if you think you own it, how many you know that when you die, you can't take nothing with you? Amen. Even when you own your house, if, if it's pay, even if it's paid for, how many know that you still don't own it? Because if you don't pay the property taxes on that, them folk going to come take your house. God is the only one who owns everything, and we need to make sure that we're using what he's given us in the way that he wants us to do it. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless this time.